Hello and welcome back to another episode of Night Mode Gaming News. Thank you for joining me here on the Snorri Time channel once again. I know it's been a few weeks since we have covered the excellent gaming news out there in the world. Uh, I have been celebrating the hottest weeks of the year around these parts. In addition to getting my new laptop up and running, new to me laptop, I should say, uh, which has caused me no amount of uh, frustration, I'm sure. <laughs> no, unfortunately, it's been causing me a great deal of frustration trying to get things up and running. I've also been farm sitting various critters, uh, and that has been taking up some of my time. But I'm glad to be back. Glad to be back and commenting on the gaming industry once more. By the way, if you enjoy this week's music, it is brought to you by Game Chomp, Game Chomps, <laughs> Game Chomps. The link will be in the description below to their wonderful music service for gamers. They have been so kind as to allow content creators like myself to use their gaming inspired music for their videos and podcasts and things. So be sure to check that out down below as well as their video game study lounge with live video game inspired music for you to relax and study to very much in line with what I am trying to accomplish myself. So I am always happy to support support them. They support me. It's a very symbiotic relationship. Speaking of relationships, one of the most exciting pieces of news that I saw over the last few weeks now was the announcement of the D&D &D Among Thieves movie. Now, I had not realized that back in the sometime between the year 2000 and 2012, there was a trilogy of Dungeons and Dragons themed movies released. This was a time where I was in high school and college, and even though my first foray into Dungeon Dungeons and Dragons happened in college, it was not it was not a good first time for me. <laughs> Mostly because um, I wasn't really encouraged to take autonomy. Uh, throughout my first few sessions, I did not continue playing. Later on in my life, I got quite involved in the D&D &D scene. Um, my husband and I actually run a an accessories company uh, together, mostly him, I just help, where we sell D&D &D themed dice and battle tokens. Very exciting stuff, but the idea of the new Dungeons and Dragons film has got me so excited, mostly because it looks so well done. Just looking at the trailer, assuming they're not showing all the best parts in the trailer, um, looks very exciting, looks very promising. Having Chris Pine, one of, you know, one of the Chris's, if you will, sort of heading up the film. Uh, does certainly lend it quite a bit of credibility, as well as Michelle Rodriguez. Awesome. Super excited to see what they bring to the table. This film has nothing to do with the trilogy, by the way, as far as I can tell. Um, as far as the internet leads me to believe. And I can, can I just say Chunky Dragon? Like, I don't know how I spent a good deal of time dissecting the trailer. And Chonky Dragon was one of my favorite things, as well as Gelatinous Cube. Very, very exciting. And the idea of having this huge, rich world for the creators to draw from with the Forgotten Realms, especially as somebody who has 
played D&D semi-extensively, there's a lot to live up to there. Because the D&D fan culture is all about storytelling. Like, it's, it's, it is a game about storytelling, I would argue. And so to create a movie that tries to encapsulate the culture of the D&D fan, it is, it is a huge undertaking, but I am excited to see what they manage to do. I will be going to the premiere and I will be wearing a cloak because that would be the only appropriate fashion to don for such an occasion. In additional Wizards of the Coast news, very soon after the trailer dropped, I, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, I'm sort of trying to wrap a few weeks of news up together in this episode as sort of a catch-up episode. Uh, Wizards of the Coast sets up a video game studio led by Dragon Age producer, according to IGN.com. Now, I did play Dragon Age, uh, some of the later games, or more recent games, I suppose. Um, I never truly learned how to play. They were the sort of games that I sort of forced my way through without ever really learning until I got to the end where I needed to actually know how to play the game and thus became irrevocably stuck. And it was too late for me at that point. But Dungeons and Dragons and Magic, the gathering publisher, sets up a new studio. Oh yeah, that's they're also Wizards of the Coast is also responsible for magic. I'm not as into magic. I have a lot of friends who are into magic, uh, <laughs> unsurprisingly. I'm always getting invited to like these little, you know, just little pop-up leagues, uh, little deck building nights. And I used to play quite a bit with my sister, actually. She kicked my butt. She was quite good at it. She had so many cards. To be fair, we weren't playing by like any actually recognized league rules or anything. So we, we had some pretty broken decks back in the day. But this new studio that is being established um, is going to be led by Dragon Age's former executive producer, uh, Christian Daly. So already some really good talent um, coming on board here. I don't think there's any news as to what kind of projects they're going to be working on. The studio's name is Skeleton Key, by the way. I don't know if I mentioned that. <laughs> and this isn't the only studio, obviously, that Wizards of the Coast um, has been involved with, has established. Um, but it's just sort of interesting to me that they're going to be Ring even further into the video game scene, especially considering um, the video game scene is going through a little bit of drama right now, financially. So, kind of a weird time to be jumping in. But hey, if we can get more like single player fantasy driven, story driven games like I'm down I don't have anything against like the the multiplayer or like even games as a service model necessarily except that I don't have a lot of friends to play games with so those don't really always appeal to me I, I definitely lean more towards the single player experience but the, uh, the mid-year earnings call wrapped up while I've been away, sort of that mid-July time, and uh, which we're already a month past, right? Like I said, I'm very late with the news. Uh, things not looking so good. As as we've been talking about over the last couple of episodes of Night Mode here, 
we're seeing that that major contraction uh, financially within the games industry. And that has led to, or at least I believe has led to a slew of um, so many games being delayed or abandoned, including uh, Knights of the Old Republic remakes, Blizzard, Mobile MMO, Splinter Cell VR, you name it. There is a AAA company out there with a game that fans were excited for um, that has been delayed or abandoned, which makes sense in in a sense if these companies are actually struggling financially, of course, they might not be able to dedicate the resources necessary to to continue production on these titles or these remakes or these reboots. But it does continue a trend that I've been noticing over the last couple of years of these uh, major personnel overhauls, sometimes mass layoffs in these different companies. Usually never people at the top. Kinda sus. But I'm just saying, if you needed to come up with the money from somewhere, seems like you might be able to find a way to find it. One of the biggest companies ever, probably, Google. They've actually been testing a new launcher um, for Google Stadia straight from the web, if you can believe it. So imagine you're searching for... I don't know. What do people search for? Latest hip game? If you have a Google, Google Stadia account, which, <laughs> let's be honest, not a lot of people do, the service did not fare very well. Your Google Stadia account would be linked to your Google account. And so in those search results, Imagine Google has inserted a, a launch this title button. Some people have been seeing this. I've seen reports on Twitter. Um, obviously, if you don't have the game on Google Stadia, um, or if you don't have Google Stadia and you saw this prompt and clicked it, it'd be like, hey, hey, would you like to sign up for this service? <laughs> Which seems awfully silly. I don't know. It's it's an interesting tactic. It feels... Something about it feels a little underhanded. A little suspicious. I mean, Google is the biggest search engine in the world. And I guess maybe a conflict of interest is what I'm sort of describing here. Where they would be pushing a service that they own... through their search results. I don't know. I don't think I don't think there's obviously anything illegal about it. Um, but you know, one would hope that search results when one is looking for information would be perhaps unbiased. I don't know. Is that too much to ask? Probably. It's fine. Just something to think about if you've seen these uh these Google Stadia launch ads basically like let's call them let's call what they are it's an ad basically i am curious if anybody out there has seen anything like that i have not personally i don't have google stadia but i also just haven't seen it definitely an a b testing thing very very few people seem to have uh, encountered this phenomenon but encountered it they have it's just sort of another Another bit of drama on the docket, um, especially when you consider what is going on between Sony and Xbox. So this idea of um, that I bring up of this exclusivity, um, you know, the sort of conflict of interest that Google might have, uh, Sony and Xbox have been having their little their little tiff uh, as well uh, when it comes to th this latest um, 
regulation drama in in Brazil, um, Microsoft calling <laughs> Call of Duty a non-essential game series while Sony protested that it was because there's is this whole conflict of of a monopoly, right? Um, you're trying to, as a game company, underplay certain acquisitions of game studios, certain mergers happening at large by saying, oh no, like this, this doesn't jeopardize the integrity of the gaming industry. So we're going to say that our thing is actually not that important, even though we're willing to spend, what was it? It was a lot of money that they were willing to to spend to acquire I'm not saying it now but you can imagine how confusing that must be for the normal people looking in from the outside so you're telling us that no, this game really isn't that important, but you're willing to spend, we'll, we'll call it dozens of millions of dollars to acquire the rights to it. And somebody else is saying on the other end, like, no, this game is actually so important to, to the gaming industry or the studio who owns these rights to these games that in order to make sure that competition remains fair that we can't have these exclusivity rights which is interesting because exclusivity rights are nothing new um there are plenty epic for one uh has done tons of deals uh with game developers and publishers about uh, keeping games exclusive to their platform and oh gosh don't we all remember when it's just like the the begin in the beginning which wasn't even the beginning when every publisher it seemed like had their own game launcher like i at one point had steam and origins and gog and epic and probably other ones that I'm forgetting about on my computer because everyone was trying to maintain this sort of pristine control over their their products which I again as a business owner like I get you want to you want to have some sort of control over how your product is presented to people but my goodness not a great user experience and any Nintendo fan like you I know you know how I feel like I know you know this feeling <laughs> because Nintendo is notorious obviously for not allowing their their games and their products onto other platforms um, you're never gonna see a Mario game on the PlayStation unless it was illegally obtained or emulated well maybe not Maybe you can you can emulate things and not have obtained the copy of the game illegally, but it is it is it is sort of it's just sort of this silly drama to be watching hap like to watch happen, especially when the the earnings calls have been so so bad, um, or at least that's what they like you to think. Really, it's a contraction all things considered the the gaming industry is in not as much danger as one might be led to believe and in fact parts of it are are doing quite well i have been very impressed with the slew of indie games uh, that have been coming out this year in particular very good year for indies in fact after our uh, brief departure a few weeks back, Dreamscom 
uh, occurred. So this would have been around July 26th. And Dreamscom, if you're not familiar with Dreams, is a... I will call it a game building platform. And the number of games um, that have been made through Dreams is, is very, very impressive. And the accessibility of it to, to the normal, like regular consumer, you need very little knowledge to, to jump in and start making a game, which is every gamer's dream, right? Is, is to make their own game. And in fact, so if you own a PlayStation 4 or a 5, the, the show floor is, I believe still at the time of this recording at least, available to play. So they built this, this whole playable, immersive show floor experience. Um, and in addition to all of these, these games and these products that they were showing off, I did find some very interesting news uh, coming out, which is that there is a user working on a Silent Hills remake in Dreams. So if you remember PT, the, the playable trailer, which in order to even play anymore, you have to buy a PlayStation 4 that has the game and then make sure you never connect it to the internet uh, because it has to have not been updated basically in order to play this game because there was a, a, a pushed update that deleted the playable trailer from consoles. Um, and, and goodness, I feel like the last time I looked at what those cost, it was like $1,200 for a console with PT which could bring up a whole conversation about games preservation but like that is a topic probably for another video but it's very interesting because silent hills got canceled right and you know which is the developer's prerogative but there were enough fans a fan in particular who who wanted to see this vision come to life so badly um, that they decided to share their own version of Silent Hills um, made through Dreams on the PlayStation subreddit. Uh, and so this cancellation happened back in like, what, 2014, 2015? Um, I think the playable trailer might have been out. Yeah, was it 2014? And then, and then, of course, things happen, games get delayed or canceled all the time. Um, and again, links to all of these um, stories, or most of these stories, will be available in the description so you can, so you can check out more information. Um, but it's, it, if you look at some of the, the video comparisons, uh, that are floating around the internet, or if you play it for yourself, you can you can see what a labor of love and care this project has been for this this creator, this developer. I would even venture to say, and I think that's all. I mean, just wait for the DMCA to roll in. I'm sure it is a shame because. So much of the good of art, in sort of a philosophical sense, is its ability to affect another person. And what greater compliment could there be from one creator to another than to be inspired by your creation? To want to make something so badly that you do so legality be damned right but like I said we'll have to wait to see those uh, to see how it plays out legally I suppose sort of in that vein as I was reading through the story they also mentioned uh, you can even play a rebuilt version of uh, PT specifically using the Halo Forge leak 
So if you don't want to spend $1,200 on a PlayStation 4 with PT on it, you could play a rebuilt version using the Halo Forge League. Which, okay, that one I'm a little, I'm a little bit more concerned about because it's like, okay, maybe we shouldn't be using game engine leaks <laughs> to, like, these, these, uh, tools, if you will, that are not supposed to be available, <laughs> uh, to make things and then to circulate them. But I don't know. It'll be, it will be interesting to see how, um, Miyazaki... How, how the whole legal thing rolls out. Oh my gosh, we're already 25 minutes in. In case anybody is still with us at this point. Be sure to get up, stretch, grab a drink, grab a snack, check in with yourself, check in with your body, see if there's anything you need. Hopefully you're asleep by now. I don't know if I've ever sort of explicitly said that that is kind of the point of these podcasts. I mean, on the one hand, yes, I hope that they are informative, probably not necessarily entertaining, but relaxing enough that one could fall asleep to them. I've always been told that I have like very much radio DJ voice, especially when I'm just comfortable and I gotta tell you I am comfy in my studio speaking of comfy and probably one of the comfiest games I've played this year which is gonna sound a little crazy once you hear of it is Cult of the Lamb uh, I did post a first hour gameplay slash like first impressions and chill recording to the channel here a few days ago partly as a test for my setup which is great because like right now so far the podcast mm, mwah, perfect like chef's kiss everything is looking so good which was not the case for the gameplay I did have a couple of crashes I'm still trying to figure out how I'm going to deal with all that nonsense but that is a problem for future Kenny because right now present Kenny wants to tell you about Cult of the Lamb. It is absolutely delightful. Now, if you know me or have been around for a little while, you might know that my love for Animal Crossing, specifically older Animal Crossing titles, is is quite great. And Cult of the Lamb, while definitely not a social or community simulator, definitely has like that sassy Animal Crossing feel that I've been missing from Animal Crossing for a number of years now. It's like Animal Crossing for edgelords. And the dungeon crawler aspect and sort of the uh, procedurally generated rogue light elements of the game, I'm actually enjoying quite a bit. I am playing on normal difficulty, which I will admit when I first started playing, I was like, oh man, maybe I should have played on easy, but a lot of that has to do with the nature of the roguelite elements. Usually I pick a weapon and I just stick to it and I never gain proficiency in any other weapon type, but because of the mechanics of Cult of the Lamb. Every single run generally has different weapons and abilities that you are utilizing. And so I definitely wasn't uh, able to show off my, my greatest uh, gameplay there. But I did make it through uh, the first chunk of the game. And I am enjoying it immensely. And seeing how my little cult members react to things, how they get along with each other is is quite interesting. And I'm, I'm really interested to see um, how the game develops over time. 
specifically because um, there is in the, the main menu a roadmap section and currently all it says is that updates are planned. There's no hint as to what those updates might actually be yet. Um, but I, I, I will be interested to see what they are when they come out. So I'll be keeping my eyes out for that. I do plan if I remember, uh, or I'm so inclined, if, if the game holds my attention to the end, to probably do some other video in the future about the game as a whole once I am closer to the end and sort of wrapping up my time with it. Um, so that way you get sort of that bookend of like the first impressions and then sort of like my final impressions. Which I mean to say, it's a Devolver, Devolver digital game, right? That's who published the game. And they just can't miss right now, <laughs> recently. Uh, so many good things happening for them. A few weeks ago, we had talked about um, the Netflix games, a um, handful of which Devolver Digital has been involved with. Uh, and those, funnily enough, I saw a Kotaku article on it uh, telling people, hey, like, don't miss out on Netflix's games. Now, these are games that generally have been available other places like Moonlighter and Battletech specifically. Uh, Pointy, not sure if that's actually available anywhere else except on the Netflix app. Um, that's the only place that I've played it and seen it. And I do recommend it. It has a very like Fruit Ninja sort of vibe. Uh, it's very easy to just do a couple of runs. It's very easy to, to say just a couple couple more runs. Just another run. One more time. You know, I can really do better this time. And then suddenly, like, an hour is gone and your phone is hot. That's one of the problems with mobile games is they will heat up your phone and eat up your battery. So just keep that in mind if it is something that you decide to check out. Um, but this isn't, this isn't the only game that Devolver Digital has, um, on their plate. The ones that I'm looking forward to are Return to Monkey Island and Angerfoot. So, um, we'll have to keep our eyes out for that. Angerfoot, um, hasn't had any drama surrounding it as far as I'm, I'm aware, but I know Return to Monkey Island did get a fair bit of drama uh, during one of their recent Nintendo Directs, of all things, uh, some fans took to Twitter to to harass the Return to Monkey Island devs, which is such a shame because um, people didn't like the art style or something, which for me is very confusing. Certainly, I am not the most devoted fan uh, of, of the series, uh, but I didn't think there was anything particularly uh, underwhelming about the style. I felt like it was very much in keeping with how the series had been presented in the past. I do have a friend who's actually a huge Return to Monkey Island fan. Um, and, you know, I actually was very proud of the devs. And they basically said, you know, this is not fun for us, for, for you guys to be, for you fans to be harassing us. Like the whole point of what we're doing as game devs and with this franchise is to bring people joy and to have fun ourselves. And you are not facilitating that. So for shame gamers, for shame. Uh, and the reason I was thinking about that is because the Cult of the Lamb developers also released a statement um, the day the game released, which would have been the 11th because people had taken to Twitter and started harassing them about why isn't the game out yet? Why isn't the game out yet? And they're like, look, look, we're, we're hoping to have it out, you know, by noon Eastern Standard Time or something. But Twitter is not the right place for you to be harassing devs. There is no right place to be harassing devs for a game that you love. Now, 
harassing devs for like poor behavior that's a different story than again like we don't have enough time within the scope of this little podcast that i'm doing to probably dive into like holding devs accountable for their bs <laughs> we'll have to do that another time but do better gamers have a little patience we know you're excited but don't don't make this a problem for everyone don't ruin this for everyone it's it's a little disconcerting the stuff i've been seeing not only amongst members of the industry but also the fans and it was i mean it was always like this but we just didn't have the kind of access back in the day you know when we got all of our news from magazines assuming you were even well off enough to afford subscriptions to those magazines or you lived somewhere or you could get them on a regular basis which i certainly was neither of those things most of the gaming news i heard was severely secondhand and usually usually because the the news was old news by then did you hear this game was gonna release yeah no i like it's gonna release in a month from now uh it was announced you know a year ago <laughs> so silly so silly all of this immediate access the internet has afforded us has made us so impatient just so silly so unfortunate but what are you gonna do if you're gonna chill out is what you're gonna do <laughs> a good way to chill out and probably have a few laughs if i'm being honest is by watching youtube i do like to make these recommendations because like it's very easy to sort of fall down the rabbit hole of youtube um but there's a new show on uh, the MinMax channel, M-I-N-N-M-A-X. I will be leaving a link down below, talking about the legacy of Hatsune Miku. And before you get on me about watching uh, this discussion on Hatsune Miku, as I'm not even a, I'm not even a fan, like not really. I I know of of this character, the Vocaloids through mostly pop culture and like third party references but they were and she was and is kind of a huge cultural force in like a specific part of the culture and a part that I'm sort of adjacent to being one not only a video gamer but also like kind of a weeb and a enjoyer of anime and manga and uh web comics and webtoons and and things and manhua and uh, so you know it's like well i have to watch this and then that got me thinking about the whole history of vtubers and then that got me thinking about sort of this this culture of anonymity that has been embraced it's always existed especially just because because of the nature of the internet. I mean, it's only been recently that YouTube has been like, hey, by the way, you should use your real name and have some accountability so that when you leave comments, it's like, it's your real name attached. Because when your real name is attached to something on the internet, you're less likely to be rude. <laughs> you're less likely to be mean because it's just true, right? Psychologically. But there's a whole slew of creators who have embraced the culture of anonymity and have not only embraced it, but have turned it into a, a career of faceless YouTubers, VTubers, PNG tubers, um, AVA tubers. I don't know if that last one is real. <laughs> that one I might have just made up. But it is an interesting thing to consider. Especially, again, 
talking about some of this animosity that you've been seeing in the gaming industry and amongst fans and the relationship between fans and devs. A point to consider. These are not, hopefully, actions that the fans would have taken if they were actually face to face with these devs. You would hope. So perhaps there is some wisdom in requiring a certain amount of honesty on the internet to at least admit who you are. Again, I don't want to take away anybody's prerogative to pursue things like VTubing or adopting a certain kind of persona for the internet. Because I think there is a certain amount of levity that one can have when they feel anonymous. Sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes it's a bad thing. Anyways, it just has me thinking sort of overall about the whole situation. But I do recommend that chat. I will link a few videos down below. And as much as I, I don't know, hopefully I'm not actually complaining. <laughs> hopefully it doesn't sound like I'm actually complaining. I'm just trying to be thoughtful about the whole situation. One of the older pieces of news that I did come across was this program, apparently, which wrapped up earlier um, this summer uh, by the State Department who were pursuing people-to-people -people diplomacy through video games. I actually learned about this through a Washington Post article by Noah Smith um, that basically the United States government is exploring the idea of using video game programming and developing coding um, as a means for diplomacy, uh, where a total of 450 students from across the United States, Israel, uh, the United Arab Emirates, and Bahrain participated in a 10-week program called Game Exchange, completing a total of 170 new video games uh, based on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which honestly, that garbage I could care less about. And But I think it's cool. It's an interesting concept, at least. To use video games in government. We can have everybody duke it out in, like, the latest Madden game, you know, to decide the fate of nations. In fact, you know, perhaps if we just sent all of our politicians to summer camp, they'd be able to bond over s'mores and kumbaya and come to an agreement on, you know, the fiscal plan for the nation. Not to seem flippant, but of course people are going to bond when they work together. And I imagine that some of these kids did actually create some very long-lasting friendships. And I do think friendship is an important part to humanizing people who would otherwise be dehumanized in, in your mind due to just the mere fact that they are strangers. Because we do. The internet shows us. When you actually don't know these people, when you don't have to face up to the consequences of your actions, people act horribly. Not everybody. It's all very general over here. So I do think it is important to expose not only children, but most people to humans who have a different opinion than them. Again, I don't try to get overly political or religious here, although it's bound to happen. It's, all, it's always going to seep in, right? 
But the important thing is to think, to consider, maybe seek truth. In fact, that is probably the most important thing to be doing. And it might seem awfully trivial of me, you know, say, seek truth. I'm talking about video game industry news. But that is a thing that I am interested in. And you are interested in, well, maybe this, but also probably some other things. And there might even be some parallels that you can see between things like video games and diplomacy. Things like video games and how we treat our fellow man. Things like video games and how we decide what to pursue in life. It might be silly, but it's no more silly than most other pursuits. And so don't be ashamed of it. If video gaming is what you like, then it's what you like. If it's what you do, it's what you do. I think there's value in that. And I think on that thought, I'm ready to wrap it up for today. It's always quite lovely to do these. (laughs) I say, even though this is the third one, I do hope that I can continue having these conversations in the future, mostly just as a medium through which I can process my own thoughts and things. But I would be happy to hear your comments as well. If you're already asleep, I'm glad you were able to to fall asleep. If you're still with me here, hopefully this has been a relaxing presentation of the news. I know sometimes gaming news can be so chaotic and robust. I don't know if that was quite the word I was looking for, but something like that. But until next time, sweet dreams. Thank you.